And welcome back to the Constitutionals Podcast. I'm your host, Chad White. If you didn't know, this is the premiere podcast for the website, cpluscomedy.com. Like I just said, it's a website. Go there. Uh, let's see how this is sounding. I don't know. I used the microphone earlier this week to record something for news time. And it was in a fashion. No, it was a, it was an interview. I recorded an interview. I did an interview with somebody who is an actor on the television show NCIS. And they, they've done comedy, so that's the reason I talk to them. They've done comedy, uh, but I, I talked to them uh, via the phone. And I was, I was actually, it was in the, it was in the, in the evening time, uh, my local time, and in, in Atlanta, and I had the phone right there, propped up with the way it's sitting. Oh crap! I gotta turn on this stupid stopwatch. <laughs> had the phone all propped up and everything. And, had the microphone binaural. It, there's like modes, different modes of this microphone. Anyway, I recorded. I recorded the, the interview with this microphone. It was good. Sounds great. Lasted half an hour. Uh, wonderful person. I can't wait to put that thing out. I got to type it up this weekend. I also have to type up the last interview I did from last week. So, but uh, there's no rush on either of those. Hey, let's see it. Oh wait, hold on. Before I get onto anything, uh, today I was at work. I'm sitting there doing my work thing. And I'm looking, I'm looking at news articles and I have an RSS feed that links up to a bunch of different websites. Um, obviously anyway, I was in the, and I have it organized. I'm a very organized person. So I put the, I went to the text. None of this matters. Anyway, <laughs> Microsoft released a beta for enabled to hook up your, your Google home, your Google assistant up to your Xbox. And it was 956 this morning when I was reading it. And I thought, man, if I, I, I wish I knew about this two hours ago before I came to work. Uh, it was, uh, and I, uh, but I'm, I'm now, obviously now I'm home. First thing I did after making a bowl of cereal and watching the TV show Single Parents, now that it's back on ABC, uh, I, I, I set that up. And it, it works. I can say, hey, blank, which is Google. I can say, hey, that turn on Xbox and the Xbox will turn on or I can pause it or I can turn it off and that's it. <laughs> There's more you can do, but, uh, it's not worth it. You can't, I mean, you can say launch Netflix, launch who well, you can't say launch Netflix because I didn't understand when I said that I said launch Hulu. It worked launch YouTube. It worked regardless. I'm excited. It's just the beta. I don't really do betas, but I had to turn this on cause I have, I have so many Google assistants in my home and I have an Xbox and I just, this is what I wanted it's so bad for this Xbox. <laughs> so now I can do it. So there you go. There's that. (laughs) Okay, let's move on. Let's get on to this thing that no one cares about but me. Uh, First up, Vox Media acquires New York Magazine. This happened uh, sometime this week. (laughs) This comes from the New York Times, written by Mark Tracy and Edmund Lee. I know Edmund Lee. Not personally. What is this Lenovo Vantage? I don't care. I don't open up programs on here. Uh, Vox Media acquires a new New York magazine, chronicler of the highbrow and lowbrow. If you don't know what New York Mag is, it's a, I don't know how I would describe it. New York Mag is kind of, uh, (laughs) let's see, New York Mag, I don't want to, because I I like, I like the website. I don't read, I don't read the magazine. I like the website. It's basically the same thing. New York Mag is um, what rich white hipsters a very important rich rich part love to read and that's it (laughs) the new york mag is a great website i enjoy it on tuesday vox media agreed to acquire new york media the company behind the bi-weekly print magazine and five popular online offshoots and an all-stock transaction neither company would disclose the value of the deal while consolidations in the media industry typically mean cutting costs at the expense of quality journalism, Vox in New York said their combination was something different. They are bringing together a much decorated print magazine, websites, a podcast empire, and several streaming deals, television deals, the very model, they hope, of a modern media company. I think that they have uh, everything that is needed for a successful uh, new new style media company. If you take on one hand, if you look at AT&T, which is drastically, it's, it bought up Warner and it's in 140, $150 uh, million dollars worth of debt. 
and it's also trying to offload <laughs> DirecTV either into its own company or to somebody else, maybe to Dish. This is what the rumors are that maybe uh, they'll offload. Uh, AT and T will drop off DirecTV and just give it to Dish, the only other satellite company. Uh, and you see, you see them struggling, but then you see other other companies like Disney who are just happen to be uh, excelling at this. Now this camera turned off and I'm going to go turn it on. It's going to be a half second of silence. It's longer than a half second. Oh God. All right. It's longer than a half second of silence. (laughs) Jesus. I don't know why this thing is turned off all the time. My laptop's turning off on me. This camera's turning off on me. I don't know what's going on. So we, so when you have someone like AT and T, who's looking to lose assets, and then you have someone like Disney who's looking to gain as much as possible, then you gotta you gotta understand that there is some type of median in play where, and it's not just because Disney has all of these successful franchises. Obviously, that's a part of it. But if if Disney can somehow, Disney has struck an uh, an artery in the pop culture consciousness where everything is po- where everything it owns is popular. Let's get, let's get off of Disney. Let's go let's go to a network. Let's say uh, Viacom. Oh, that's failing just like AT and T. Let's say CBS. So CBS owns CBS, CBSN, which is CBS News, CBS Sports, which is I mean none of these are really networks except for CBS and. Um, what else? Uh, Pop, Pop TV. CBS is on the come up because it has the highest rated shows on television, network sh- on network television, and the uh, most consistent rated. Where am I going with this? What New York, what New York media, and what Vox can do? What they're going to be able to do with this? What Vox is going to be able to do, and in, in, by owning New York media, is that it's going to. Vox is mostly a political driven website. New York. Uh, mag is kind of like I said, highbrow, lowbrow. It's um, it's politics plus because and uh, with with the pur- with Vox's purchase of New York Media, it also bought uh, the cut, which is the style ver- the style portion of New York Mag, Grub Street Food, obviously Intelligentsia, which is politics, uh, the Strategist, which is shopping, and Vulture. So Vox owns Vulture. Uh, and Vox was kind of missing a, a pop culture uh, section of that. Now, Vulture does is garbage. <laughs> Vulture is trash. <laughs> it's straight up trash. But uh, but now but now it's this is this is something that this is something that's good for for all for both companies involved. So New York Media uh, was losing as much as 10 million a year before a recent upturn, according to two people with knowledge of the company. The company laid off about 5% of its staff this year. Now, compared to BuzzFeed, which laid off, I think, 30% or some some crazy percentage. Uh, BuzzFeed laid off a bunch of people. Disney, uh, everybody lays off a bunch of people in the media world. Hopefully not. You know, people who work intelligent like me. <laughs> the blah, blah, Okay, let's start back to the nine, blah, blah, blah. Now, there's a quote in here that I, okay, okay. Uh, Jim Bankoff, the Vox Media chief executive and chairman, pledged that the merger would not result in editorial layoffs or the folding of any of the New York-related uh, publications, including the print magazine or the Vox brands, which include Verge, Eater, Curbed, Vox, and SB Nation. Nothing changes. This is what he said. Nothing changes editorially for any of our brands. All right, so we have to take him at his word. <laughs> it's la- This is what happened last week. Uh, po- Pocket Cast, the number my favorite uh, podcast streaming app. The last week they changed it. They announced that they said, uh, "Hey, those normal features you like on Pocket Cast, guess what? You gotta pay a subscription for them, baby." And so for every year, it's gonna be like ten dollars a month. I think it's like ten, yeah, ten dollars a month every year. Why I say every year, ten dollars a month, and you have and you get the same things that you normally get with. Po- I don't want to point my phone. You guys, it's on there. Uh, you get the same thing you normally get with Pocket Cast now, but you're not going to be paying for it. And then people are in uproar because you paid for the app, you paid for access on the web, pay for it on iOS and Android. So people like me, that's like fifteen bucks you paid already for five dollars for each one of these each one of these versions of the app. And uh, now they're going to charge you for stuff that you already paid for. And then in, in like a day, Pocket Cast said, you know what? We're not going to do that. 
So hopefully this guy is, is not is not lying and saying that my lip my mouth is just like I'm kissing the microphone at this point. <laughs> hopefully he's not lying. <laughs> Let's get back to it. Uh, just go, go read this article. There's a I want to move on to some other stuff, but it's it's uh, very good. And they they compare Vox and uh, and New York Mag to the to whatever else is out there. <laughs> New York Times. <laughs> whatever uh vox has tv shows uh, they have a show uh, on um, netflix called explained they uh, are going to start creating shows for hulu uh with with david chang and chrissy teigen so it's going to be uh, vox is vox is making major media moves major media moves that is the title of this episode <laughs> I, I, it's great that I'm the one person that and they can just handle all of this at once. Hey, let's uh no no no, we'll get we'll be, we'll get down there in a second. I want to talk about this. Uh okay, finish off this section. This is us has huge ratings online. This is from the rap. Written by Jennifer Moss. This is how big This Is Us is on Hulu and on the NBC app exclusive. This is an exclusive story if you didn't know. So This Is Us is, uh, I know I said CBS is the highest rated network, broadcast network on television. It is. Keep that in mind. It's the highest rated broadcast network on television. However, there are still shows that manage to get uh, in the double digits or consistent ratings, which is like 9 million now. It used to be back in the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, there were only like a handful of channels. Uh, and even when cable started in the ninety, in the late eighties and the nineties, uh, it is it's just, I mean, shows could get well over twenty million people watching, uh, which is insane by today's standards. Like if twenty million people watch one thing today, it's either the Super Bowl or an episode of Game of Thrones, and those only I think those topped out at seventeen million this year. Um, I wouldn't doubt if they were lower <laughs> based on how many people like it. I like Game of Thrones this year, but who cares? Uh, my, uh, I'm wrong, apparently. Um, so, so yeah, you could, like, Big Bang Theory was, what, the highest rated show on network, and it's at, like, what, 15 million? If that, if that. I don't even know. I don't know the numbers. But this is us. Now with the streaming age, shows can perform well above what they were you know, in the early 2000s, or I'm sorry, not, excuse me, in the 2010s, in the early 2010s, when streaming was just becoming the new, was becoming this new thing, and people weren't watching TV, and they were dropping cable, but they didn't have streaming yet, uh, but now with this world of uh, TV antennas, and streaming, and apps, and uh, online cable, like Hulu with live TV, and YouTube TV, and Sling, uh, and PlayStation View, I'm going to keep naming, uh, 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 Pluto, <laughs> what else, oh God, uh, Orbi, no, FUBU, FUBU, FUBI, is that what's called, FUBU, not FUBU, it's FUBO, FUBO, because it's the sports one, <laughs> no, this matters, so now with all this difference, uh, all these different ways to access shows, you, uh, the Nielsen ratings have to have a way to to, to count the shows. So now uh, you can watch a show live and they'll still know you watch it live. So if I, if I turned on Law & Order SVU premieres tonight, uh, the season 22 or whatever, if I watch it tonight on my, ex, on my Xbox, on the NBC app live, it's going to be counted that way because I signed up via the cable subscription. However, if I had Hulu with live TV and I watched it that way, it would still be counted. But if I watched it tomorrow, on Friday or Saturday or Sunday with the NBC app or the Hulu app, uh, then it would be counted uh, within the same, within a new type of rating system called Live Plus Three Day. And those are, and that was made for streaming because, and Hulu because uh, people watch things, you know, not the day of, mostly. That's why it's important to watch things. Uh, if you like a show, and you and it's not people and people either like it, but it's not getting it's not getting views or people don't like it. And it's also not getting views. Just watch it. Just watch it as soon as possible. Don't bank episodes. Don't uh, binge. Just watch the episodes as they air or as close to the three day period as to when they air. So if it airs on Monday, watch it by Thursday 
and that you'll be fine because that's how the, p- these networks are just insane about ratings and that as they should be truly uh it might be a surprise to so much the nbc family drama grows when counting streams on hulu and the nbc app which is 42 percent in the advertiser coveted adults 18 to 49 demographic and 20 percent in total viewers according to data provided by nbc to the rap exclusively oh, brag the third season of This Is Us averaged a 3.8 rating. I'll explain these numbers in a second. 3.8 rating in the key 18 to 49 range, according to live plus seven day Nielsen data. Wow, they're doing seven days. Okay. I guess that's I guess that's smart. I guess doing seven days would be better. Uh, I think I think the immediate ratings are what's important. And then What's even more important is the live plus three day. But I think seven day is just a way to say, hey, you know, well, let's 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 get these last uh, couple hundred thousand viewers. <laughs> let's see how this does. But when adding in streams on Hulu and the NBC app, the week's worth of delayed viewing increases to a five point four rating. See, that's uh, look at that. It jumped up uh, one point. F- oh, no, I can't do math. <laughs> 1.6? That's it, right? 3.8 plus 1.6. Let's do this. <laughs> Come on, Chad. Don't be stupid. He's 5.4. <laughs> oh, I used to be horrible at math, and I'm only good at it when it comes to the things that don't matter like this. Looking at total viewers in the same L plus uh, 7 time frame, live plus 7 day time frame, season 3 increases from the Nielsen reported 13.8 million viewers to 16. Point. Six million when though when including those sets of eyeballs watching on watching Hulu and the ABC app. So now you can see how it the numbers jumped up three million over three million viewers, which is that's what you that's kind of how you inflate to advertisers, you know, because a lot of people, even if you subscribe to Hulu with the no ads, just the twelve the twelve dollar per month version, uh, there are still a lot of people who are subscribing to the six dollar per month version because they got it they you know they get Spotify with it or something and that still has ads and they're showing ads with this forty two minute episode of This Is Us. So every time you see Randall cry or something, that's the only person I know on this show, Sterling K. Brown <laughs> and uh, Chrissy, Chrissy Metz, uh Marilyn Monroe. Nope, that's not that's not Mandy Moore and Milo Ventimiglia. And that's it. That's everybody I know on that show. Kevin something? I don't know. The handsome white guy. Their brother. That's how you that's how you know. I don't know what I was saying before. I forgot. (laughs) I'm gonna go off on this tangent. NBC says that over the course of its first three seasons, This Is Us has reached an average of 79 million people unduplicated. So just it means unique views in the US, which is about 20% of the entire country. When counting linear viewing as well as digital platforms, fun fact: that's twenty million more people than a Netflix domestic subscriber base. Whatever. So that means seventy-nine million people have watched that show, Pew! including me. I stopped. I remember where I stopped. Memphis. It was right when Randall's dad died. I stopped after that episode, and I never went back. I always, I always said, I remember before season two, I said, I'm going to catch up. I'm going to catch up before this show gets back on. I'm going to watch This Is Us, and I'm going to enjoy it. And I never watched it again. <laughs> I said, no more This Is Us, baby. <laughs> All right. So there you go. Uh, you want to what you want to hit the eighteen forty nine? We 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 saw the demographic rating. That's the most that's the most coveted rating uh, for men. It's eighteen to thirty five, I believe. And for women, it's ooh, boy. I don't know the women's ratings. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but you want to you want to be able to you want to appeal to the base who's going to watch TV more and who watches more TV than a bunch of teenagers who are in college and a bunch of people who are close to retirement. Eighteen to forty-nine. That's what you want. And the three points in the uh, nine point seven in the demo. The higher the number, the better it is. <laughs> Just basically, that's what it's, that's what I that's what I've learned. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, let's take a break, and then we'll come back. We'll talk about the Emmys and Netflix and HBO. <laughs> Two, one. Welcome back to the podcast. 
I have to make sure this camera's still going. <laughs> this is like two minutes of me. Uh, oh, I got to restart this number thing or what they call a, what the kids call a timer. <laughs> Let's move on. Netflix's new acquired shows are big, but the stocks fall. Why did I read the, the description that I wrote down? You don't want to, you don't care about that. This comes from the Washington Post, written by Tara LaChapelle. Netflix lands Seinfeld uh, suffer shrink. So as we know, there is a b- big surplus, a big surge. Excuse me, I had to burp a little bit. There's a big surge to purchase old sitcoms that are in syndication and be the only streaming service to be able to show that sitcom. Now, it's important. The show has to be in syndication. It's very important, which means it reaches over 100 episodes. Uh, And it has to be popular. (laughs) I mean, the rest of that. Nothing of what I said matters. It has to be ultra popular. So you'll notice shows like uh, Cheers, Parks and Rec, The Office, Seinfeld, all the uh, friends, all these different shows, uh, again, selling for uh, triple digit millions to Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, to Amazon's not my <laughs> to Netflix and Hulu. <laughs> it's funny how the most cash rich uh, streaming service does not buy, does not even attempt to buy shows. Like if, if Jeff Bezos himself wanted to buy streaming rights to Seinfeld, like he could do it. He could just buy it outright. He has the money. Anyway, why? I mean, why don't you do that? Okay. So Friends is staying on Netflix until for, I think, one more year. Yeah, one more year until next summer, I believe, or next spring, next spring or summer, until it moves to Warner Media's HBO Max streaming service. Seinfeld is leaving Hulu after being on there since, boy, since I was in college. So it's probably been like six years, right? So after being on Hulu for six years, it's moving to Netflix. The Office is moving to Peacock. Parks and Rec will eventually move to Peacock. 30 Rock's going to be on Peacock. This is so stupid. But it's also important to know that even with these uh, these uh, this surge to buy these shows, and I'll use the word that the Washington Post used, uh, Miss LaChapelle used. Uh, she's also, worked, she, this is from Bloomberg too, so it's a Bloomberg opinion piece on the Washington Post. Does Washington Post own Bloomberg? Doesn't matter. <laughs> Even with all this stuff, what was I saying? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> this is so sad. I keep forgetting things. <laughs> It's funny. I don't do drugs, and <laughs> and uh, I haven't hit my head in uh, truly years. So <laughs> I don't know what the heck's going on in my brain. Maybe I'm dying. Maybe it's from football for you know 2009 to no 2008 to 2011. Maybe I'm slowly dying. It's not CTE, but maybe I'm dying because <laughs> I've hit my head outside of football. It's crazy <laughs> how much I've done. Uh, like Homer Simpson. Hey, okay. Netflix has suffered a five-day losing streak. Now that their their stocks have been in the red for a little bit, and people are smelling blood in the water, because we have fifteen new streaming services coming, and we got Apple TV Plus, Disney Plus. Hulu, uh, and then that's going to be bundled with Hulu and ESPN Plus. Then we got Warner Media coming out with HBO Max. We got Peacock coming out, uh, and then that's it. Netflix faces a twofold challenge, Ms. LaChapelle writes. There's a threat of losing customers to these new services because there's people just don't want to have multiple things. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second. As well as the need to keep spending on content to prevent that from happening. I th- I'm going to say this one more time. I've said this a thousand times. Netflix needs to just stop caring about what shows they need to acquire and just start producing their own stuff and just don't worry about like I if I was if I was Ted Sarandos, I would be eking that out. I would I like it's that coming with the friends thing. I would just be I would just be pushing out. Uh, they someone would be like, "Hey, let's pick up, let's pick up. Uh, uh, I don't know episodes of. Uh, I don't, 
Ah, oh, crap. I don't know these things. What's on? The Loud House. Let's pick up The Loud House from uh, Nickelodeon. And then if I, if I was them, I, if I was Ted Sarandos, I would go, no, 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 no. We'll make our own version. Even though The Loud House movie is going to air on Netflix. I'm on. Yeah. Why do I know this stuff? Anyway. While the terms of the Seinfeld deal weren't disclosed, the price tag reportedly exceeded the $500 million that Comcast NBC Universal paid for a similar transaction involving The Office. AT&T's Warner Media also struck a $425 million deal to stream Friends reruns, which will disappear from Netflix in 2020. Those are hefty terms for shows that haven't aired fresh episodes in quite some time, 21 years since the last episode of uh, Seinfeld. Jeff... Well, Darzak, an analyst for the Pivotal Research Group, sees Netflix's annual cash outlay for content climbing to $35 billion by 2025. Jesus crap. Keep in mind that the junk-rated borrower burned through $3 billion of cash in the past 12 months and has more than $18 billion of content obligations. Netflix is also valued at an eye-popping 28 times EBITDA more than double where it cl- is closest peers trade. It's about to go up against companies with deeper pockets and rich TV and film libraries. They have a little chart showing the streaming wars in action. Netflix shares are already beginning to feel the heat from Disney and other companies gunning for subscriber base. Charter, why is Charter at 47%? Anyway, Streaming wars are going to continue to continue going, and it's important to know that Netflix is, uh, I mean, especially with their paint throw paint at the wall approach. I just hit my nose on the thing, on the microphone. The paint throw paint at the wall approach with buying just as many things as possible and seeing what sticks and what doesn't. Because now, yeah, it's it's funny because you know they have shows like Flake. Well, with starring Will Arnett, which never did well, but they had, it has two seasons up there. But now it has, but now that just lives up there, and it's been canceled. But it's never been formally canceled. But it's been canceled, and no one's no one's watched it because who cares? And then I noticed this a couple of days ago. I was I was scrolling through Netflix on my phone, and a show that I wanted to see. I want to say I think it was Altered Carbon, a show I wanted to see. Let's say Altered Carbon that came out a year ago or a year and a half ago. It was was it wasn't I didn't even have my list, but I knew I wanted to see it. But it was but I forgotten about it because so many different things come out every single week. So now I, I had to add it to the list just to remember it. You barely remember it now. But uh, that kind of ties in with the next story, uh, the final story, written by John Coblin and Nicole Sperling of the New York Times. As HBO celebrates a big night, questions about its future looms. So uh, HBO won thirty four Emmys on Emmy night. 34. That's more than Netflix. That's more than Amazon. But Amazon did win giant Emmys, such as Fleabag winning Best Comedy, which is great because I love Fleabag. So now HBO, this article is basically saying that uh, HBO's biggest shows, Game of Thrones and Veep, are both off the air, big heavy hitters. I wouldn't say Veep was a big show because uh, Succession's a huge show. And, <laughs> you know, I've never seen anything negative about Succession. Uh, and I love Succession. It's such a great show. I love it. I listen to the theme song seven times a day, four times a day, but still. <laughs> uh, so Game of Thrones is gone. Veep is gone. And... Uh, the uh, Game of Thrones guys, David Benioff and Dan Weiss, signed a nine-figure deal with Netflix just last month. Warner Media, HBO Max, is going to be fifteen dollars, which is more than what Apple and Disney Plus will cost, and it's more than Hulu, and it's currently tied with Netflix for a price. But HBO Max is going to be different from HBO Now and HBO Go. Isn't that insane? Isn't that insane that they're going to have... This is AT&T's problem. They're splitting their base. Because they, they have uh, they have AT&T Cable, DirecTV. I'm sorry, U-verse. It's AT&T U-verse, DirecTV, DirecTV Now, uh, which is their streaming thing. Um, HBO Now slash HBO Go, which is how you tie your cable, and uh, HBO Max. Just make HBO Now and HBO Go, HBO Max. God, this is so stupid. Oh, this is so frustrating. 
Uh, then they talk about parties and stuff like that. And yeah, I don't know why I pulled this up because <laughs> this talks about parties <laughs> and it just says what, what HBO is offering. <laughs> Uh, ex- okay, so there's a there's just a bunch of mess. Uh, it's uh, what they describe as uh, messiness at AT and T. Uh, it's I mean it kind of it's it's kind of you know I can I can feel the hurt coming from the confusion that a- that the AT and T buyout has caused uh, for Warner. You know, on one hand, it does offer them kind of a stability because I don't think Time Warner would have done a streaming service but on the other hand it's it's ridiculous how stupid this is turning out to be (laughs) this is so dumb there's gonna be a point where this all just kind of fall all falls apart for AT&T and I'm not just saying streaming service just for AT&T period because I was listening to I think it was the Washington Post reports I think I was watching Post Reports, which is not the title of the podcast. It's called Post Reports. I think I was watching. I was listening to Post Reports, or either that or it was uh, Up First, both podcasts from NPR and Washington Post, respectively, or Washington Post and NPR, respectively. Uh, either that. I, I don't know. I think it was. It has to be Post Reports, um, or maybe it was the Journal from Wall Street Journal. Regardless, who cares? Uh, it wasn't post report because I haven't listened to that in a, in a couple of weeks. It was the journal. It was Wall Street Journal <laughs> podcast. I got to figure this out. <laughs> this is bothering me. And I was listening to either the Wall Street one of Wall Street Journal's podcasts, either the Journal <laughs> or the Morning One. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I was listening to one of their podcasts. <laughs> I'm going insane over here. And it was talking. They were talking about AT and T as a whole and all the streaming services it has and, and all the services it uh, portray it all it has. And what they noted is that uh, there's a lot of stuff that AT and T is doing and it's not doing it particularly well. <laughs> it, and it's a very true. It's not doing anything particularly well. Which is alarming. <laughs> but then you look at its closest competitor, which is Verizon. And yeah, Verizon has a uh, kind of a cable service. Yeah, they had an app called Go Ninety that was uh, exclusive home to streaming videos, like a Lyft driving or an Uber driving show and stuff like that with comedians and stuff like that. Um, and they have an internet service, but the core thing it does, which is cellular devices, it does well. Yeah, it's a little bit expensive. Yeah, you're locked into contracts and all this stuff, but it does it well. And then if you look at AT and T, it doesn't do anything particularly well. It doesn't have it doesn't have the best service. It doesn't have the best contracts. It doesn't have the best uh, streaming service. It doesn't have the best cable. It doesn't have the best internet. There's just so many things, so many factors that go into making a good company, and AT and T is not able to hit any of that. And uh, that's what that's what happens. I mean, that's what happens when you they reach their hands into too many pots and now they have one hundred and forty nine million dollars in debt uh, of worth of debt. Excuse me. And it's and and they're going to have to figure out, OK, well, we got to play catch up to uh, Verizon. We got to play catch up to Netflix. We got to play. Uh, we got to fend off um, Disney and Apple. Because they're also streaming services. That's f- AT&T should have really thought this through <laughs> opening up all those different uh, streaming services and cable providers but we'll see and then the last thing I want to talk about is uh, so the Emmys were this weekend this past weekend and there were a lot of winners a lot of losers <laughs> it's a lot of typical stuff and uh, but the ratings were down thirty two to thirty three percent. Ratings were hu- just a huge sloping, gaping nothing. And I think it was like fourteen million people. Don't call me on that. But it was down thirty three percent. Same age as our Lord when he was uh, crucified on that cross. <laughs> and and uh, so the Emmys were down that that, that much. Um. 
And I think you can attribute it to one factor because this is the final year for Game of Thrones. This is the final year for V. Okay, let's not say V. This is the final year for Game of Thrones. Uh, Pose was nominated. Um, so as much as you can say, it was it was kind of diverse, but it wasn't as diverse as it should be. But that, that and I don't think that was a problem because I don't because you don't want. I don't, okay, I'll get to that in a second. But if you don't, they went hostless, as did the Oscars. And but for the Oscars, you can't you can't just pick and you can't pluck pluck up you know Tom Cruise or Hugh Jackman or Kevin Hart or Dwayne Johnson. You can't just pluck up the one of the best actors because there's so many there's so many movies. I mean I, you know there's a lot of TV shows, but there's there's just like only so many movies, and you can't say this person should host. You know, but when you get to the Emmys, there are so many TV shows that. Uh, give the an actor a chance or a television host a chance to show their chops and say, I am good at hosting. Let me host this show. Look at that's why they have a lot of late night hosts host these shows. James Corden hosts the Tonys. Um uh Colbert hosts the Emmys. Kimmel hosts the Emmys. Chris Rock hosts the Oscars. That's why you have so many of the, the same people, comedians. And it's better if you get a comedian. But it's <laughs> but that's why you have so many people, actors and hosts, hosting these things because they know what to do. And if when you take that away, especially from a show that needs a host, that is in dire need of a host, like the Emmys, that you just ruin it. I know I understand that they probably <laughs> We're like, we don't want to reach any type of controversy. This will make things go faster. And to their credit, it kind of did. But it was still like 10 minutes behind because uh, I, I went to bed at like 1130. <laughs> it was still like 10 minutes behind. They, a host will tie things together. And as much as people didn't like Michael, Michael uh, Che and Colin Jost last year, they still, they say they were lethargic and that they felt like they were being held a gunshot. It was still better to have that than to have a bunch of non sequitur guests come out and say, this is how it's, <laughs> we're going to do our thing. And then that's it. When you have Ken Jong come out with Nick Cannon to promote the mass singer, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and do a, a bit on TikTok, which was maybe three times as long as it, a should have been and B as long as everybody else, then that is unfair. My Rudolph and Ike Barinholtz came out. They did a minute, a minute and a half funny. Very funny. I liked it a lot. Uh, you got uh, Gwyneth Paltrow s- sauntering out there. She was great. Uh, but then when you push things along, when you, when you force things in there, Tom Lennon, funny guy, uh, he was doing commentary, and even he was tired of that. <laughs> so, I don't know. Maybe maybe think these things through. That's why I want to put my hat into the ring. If I could host the mother-loving Emmys, oh my god, Debbie. and like just get somebody from the outside. It'd be funny. It'd be funny. People would be like, "Who is this guy?" <laughs> and I can take the shots at people. <laughs> I'll take the shots at Bob Iger. <laughs> I'll take the shots at AT and T. Now, with all that being said, uh, let's get to the diversity. This camera is going on for 19 minutes. It usually shuts off at 17, so it's very interesting to see this thing keep going. <laughs> I have to keep watching it to make sure it doesn't explode on me. Now, it's very interesting uh, all night long if you're watching the Emmys. Uh, and I, it's on Hulu, so I urge you to go check it out. It's two hours and nine minutes <laughs> uninterrupted. <laughs> I saw that this morning, and I thought, who would watch that? Who would watch the Emmys? <laughs> who, who said, all right, it finally turned off. Who would go, I got to watch the Emmys? <laughs> Turn on Hulu, cut to next year, and I'm like busy, and I have to and I want to watch it like that. I watch it the following Monday. <laughs> now I can sit down. Don't tell me who won. <laughs> it's like that episode of Friends where, uh, no, How I Met Your Mother, where they all were, uh, they missed a football game and they recorded it and they all avoided all day long the score. That's a very funny episode. <laughs> uh, so there wasn't a lot of diversity in the winners. And that saddens me because that's usually how it is. Um, I mean, like, you know, it's okay, okay. But you have all these famous people who come out and say inclusion writer, inclusion writer, inclusion writer, and they don't do anything about it. And it's been 
two and a half years since Francis McDormand got up on the stage. I'm, excuse me, it hasn't been two years. It's been a year and a half. It's been a year and a half since Francis McDormand got up on stage and said, inclusion writer. And then it's it's also been, you know, I think two and a half years. I mean, maybe like three Oscars ago, two uh, three Oscars ago. It's been three Oscars ceremonies where people were like, Oscar's so white. Uh, and, uh, and I'm blaming the famous people for this because there are 24,000 Emmy voters, not just a board, not on the board of the television Academy, but on the, on the Emmys for the television Academy. If you're in the Academy and you're an actor and you're in the Academy, you can vote. And when people don't vote for shows, and the people of color in shows or the women in shows. And I'm not saying Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And I'm not going to cut them down because they did deserve to win. But still, everybody deserves a chance to win. Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is for white women. It's not for anybody else. It's for white women. And they already, they already have their, they've already won. They're white. <laughs> they get to walk down the street and not be killed. It's imperative that if you can vote, then you vote. If you want to see Snowfall, if you want to see one of those people win the awards from Snowfall, then vote for Snowfall. That is why when they see us, Jarrell Jerome won. That's why Billy Porter won. Also, Billy Porter is just amazing at what he does. But that's why these people win because they're good at what they do and people are voting for them. Don't just vote for it. And also, don't just vote for something just because it's black or because it's got... Uh, uh, Latino people in it or Asian people or women in it vote for something that you like and I think that's what happened this year is either they voted <laughs> and it didn't work what the heck was that either they voted and it didn't work or they or they didn't vote or they voted and it worked and they voted for just when they see us and pose you know for the trans community for the queer community and for the black community <laughs> That's what they got. I would like to see more diverse winners. And I think to, you know, I I I hate to kind of put this out there and say it like this, but I think that at some point when you are given a chance to create something, when you're a person of color and you're a woman, and you're given a chance to create something as, as, you know, kind of on the same level as the white counterparts, the white male counterparts, it's important that you give it a thousand percent. You don't give it 99. You don't give it a hundred. You don't give it 110. You give it a thousand percent. If you, <laughs> I can't, I'm the, oh boy, I was about to uh, say something that would get me in trouble with my job. <laughs> okay. So let's take, let's take a show on own, like Greenleaf. Is that what it's called? Greenleaf? Or I don't know. Queen Sugar. I don't know. It's just a show that's predominantly uh, black, and uh, but it's only watched by a subsection of people because uh, you know it's not talked about outside of the circles that it's in. And then when somebody from outside the circle watches, then it doesn't stand up to Succession. It doesn't stand up to Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. It doesn't stand up to Game of Thrones. Uh, and <laughs> You know, that's not that, that that can be a matter of factors. It can be just how people watch shows, uh, but it's important to be able to distinguish yourself. Uh, and don't just make a show that is. Um, what was that show on NBC with the black couple and the white couple? It was like two years ago. I gotta scoot this little chair up. Uh, NBC sitcom. Black couple, white couple. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Let's do it. Like that. Black couple, white couple. I guarantee it'll pick it up. Not the neighborhood. Happy together. That's what it was called. Happy together. No, it's not happy together. No, happy together was. Uh, what's the NBC sitcom with the black couple? Oh my god, and the white couple. And it, it pissed me off because it, it came on. Oh Jesus. Okay, NBC sitcom. <sighs> This is embarrassing. I am so sorry that this is even happening. List of programs previously broadcast by NBC. So we're going to go to the Wikipedia. The Wikipedia. <laughs> the Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Jesus. Oh my God. Look at all these shows. Fresh Prince. Get Smart. The Good Life. There was a sitcom. I'm just, I just scrolled past everything. <laughs> Uh, and I swear this this will mean something as soon as I the Tracy Morgan show. I watched that show. I used to think that was such a funny show. I bet it does not stand up <laughs> the test of time. What is this show called? Maybe I should just type in like 2017. Is it Perfect Couples? No, that's Olivia Munn in that show. Oh my God, why did I know that? <laughs> and Hayes MacArthur. So many people outsourced. Uh oh my god, what is this show called? My two dads? No. <sighs> this show is supposed to be 30 minutes. <laughs> Marlin? No. What is this show called? Okay, you know what? Hold on, let's do this. NBC Sitcoms 2016. It was about uh it was a couple Oh my god, this is so embarrassing. It was a couple, and one was black and one was white. Not trial and error, not Marlin. Uh, oh, Jesus. Oh my gosh, this is impossible. It's not, it wasn't, it could, it had to be 2016. But I'm going to go back to 20, I'm going to be doing 2017. Uh Oh, Jesus. Nope, we can't play that. <laughs> so, let's see. AP Bio, Good Place, Cancellations. Oh, this is embarrassing. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> What's that? Man with a Plan? No. <laughs> We just got quiet. I did this. You know what? Who cares? Okay. Anyway, it was a show about a black couple and a white couple. And when you get a chance to make a, a sitcom, uh, when you get a chance to make a sitcom, you and then you make it a multicam because it's cheaper and you can do so many things in so many days. Uh, and then the jokes are just aren't funny. Um, then I mean that's what happens. That these sh- the shows get canceled or you don't get recognized or they're poorly rated. Truly, truly. I mean, you can't just, don't just put people of color in it and then uh, write a third of a script and then go, that is it. We are done. Because that doesn't make sense. Because that doesn't, that doesn't make anybody else look good. Like, don't you, don't you want to do the best gosh darn show that you can possibly do? Because that's what I would want to do. That's what I want to do. Not would want to do. That's what I want to do. Truth be told, that's what it's called. <laughs> uh, it was 2015. I was a year. I was two years off. A year and two years. Because Mark Paul Gosselaar. I knew he was in it. I was thinking in my head, it's Mark Paul Gosselaar. But you know what? And Tone Bell. It's hot in here. What I'm trying to say is just do your best. Listen, if you like what you heard here, head on the website, cpluscounting.com, where there's going to be some interviews coming out soon. And, uh, yeah, one from a woman who stars on NCIS and another from another comedian who I've talked to before. Both phone interviews, both wonderful. Hopefully, I got some more coming up. And uh, follow us. Uh, no, 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 no. If you want to see a video version of this podcast, and God, I please pray you do. <laughs> Check out uh, youtube.com slash cpluscounting. You can see me in all my glory for the past 50 minutes or 40 some odd minutes because I did take a break. So 48 minutes. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at C Comedy. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Chad Black and White. Like us on Facebook. Um, oh, if you also want to see the video, if you, <laughs> this is a show that we do every week called News Time. News Time is a wonderful show. It's like the daily show except less funny. We take one topic from the entertainment news world and dissect it. In a script form. Very fun. Very fun, very funny. I like it and do it. Uh, This week's episode was about the NFL celebrating 100 years and SportsCenter also turned 40. So there's that. I did a a very elaborate and very, very long, I think the longest cold open I've ever done uh, in the vein of SportsCenter. So check it out. Making fun of Antonio Brown. I wrote it. Here's here's what happened. I wrote it on Sunday. I shot it on Sunday. And then I was too tired to do anything else. And then I edited it. (laughs) 
<laughs> and put it out on Tuesday. <laughs> so it was way behind some time, but whatever, who cares? Check it out. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. You're the best. Bye.